John, for that insight into the workings of the subconscious. Uh, well, the introduction has kind of already happened. Uh, the first session is a paper co-authored by Peter Graham and David Henderson, but Peter is going to present the first session. So without any further ado, shall we welcome our first speaker from the University of California at Riverside, Peter Graham. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, John Templeton Foundation. Uh, this is great that they've supported this project and so many philosophy projects around the country. Uh, I'd like to thank all the organizers, John, for putting this on, Jonathan, Jim, and Josh. Um, and it's so nice to be here with so many friends. Um, it's a great experience. When I came in last night uh, in the taxi, we, we got off the freeway and turned up Grand, and I saw the Chipotle and the Starbucks, and I suffered a little shock, <laughs> shock of the new, and at the same time, waves of nostalgia. So it's uh, great to be back in St. Louis and back here on campus at St. Louis University. Uh, this is a, a paper uh, co-authored, but really it's not a Peter Graham and David Henderson. We're still at an early collaborative stage, so it's more like Peter Graham or David Henderson, or it's an inclusive or at any point in the presentation. And I've got the easier part. Uh, David's going to do some of the heavy lifting. And so my job, I'll, I'll say this again, is to help set up what David's going to do. OK, the title. And I'm going to have a weak thesis. One thing I want to convince you of, and I think it should be easy, uh, that some norms, social norms, are a kind of norm. And so knowing about social norms illustrates epistemic normativity and epistemic behavior. We make judgments about what people ought to believe. And we influence what people ought to believe in what they do uh, through social norming. And so that's what epistemology does. We investigate epistemic belief, epistemic behavior, and so on. And so epistemologists will be served by knowing about the category of social norms. It's coming into the, to the field, and that's what this conference is about. But say 15 years ago, it was not prominent. It was not part of our toolbox. So the weak thesis is to get this concept, a concept from social science, into the toolbox of epistemology, a special social, social epistemology. There are some moderate theses um, that people are starting to explore. One is that social norms partly explain uh, the epistemology of testimonial uptake. So if you work on the epistemology of testimony, it's good to have this concept. They also partly explain the function and functioning of epistemic evaluations. And so there's much more discussion. There's a book coming out of papers edited by David and John Greco on epistemic evaluations. Some kinds of epistemic normativity might even reduce to social normativity. So if you're interested in the metaphysics of epistemic normativity, then knowing about social norms helps. And furthermore, there's more discussion about epistemic injustice and many forms of epistemic injustice arise from social norms and social practices. So again, to combat it or to change our practices, you'd want to know about social norms and social normativity. There's a strong thesis that's also in the literature that's worth flagging. I'm not going to argue for it. I'm just suggesting that it's out there. In fact, I think it's probably not entirely true. Um, but you might think that all epistemic normativity just reduces to social normativity. The only real kind of normativity you might argue, it comes from social normativity. So there's no such thing as objectively valid or real epistemic normativity. So that's a strong thesis. And so having that concept at a minimum helps you understand the thesis and why someone might argue for it. Again, that's not my thesis. That's just a part of the, the evidence for the weak thesis, that having the concept of social normativity is a concept that you should have in your toolbox when doing epistemology. All right, those are the theses. That's what I'm about. Here are my goals. Uh, to articulate the category, category well enough to establish the weak thesis. So for some people, it's a new concept. And so having clear, concrete cases is a way of articulating it. And then having some theories on the table from social scientists is a way to make the concept real in our minds. So that's one of my goals. So the interest of the moderate theses, I think it'll be self-evident just talking about it out loud, uh, going through some of the questions. Render intelligible the strong thesis so you know what these people are arguing for and where they're coming from, people who defend the strong thesis. Uh, 
And then lastly, to set up David's talk, which is probably the most important goal, uh, so that David's talk goes as well as possible. That'll be my final goal. Here's the outline. I'll talk about different kinds of norms, different kinds of normativity. I'll give some examples of social norms. And then I'll try to give enough examples to convince you that it's at least highly plausible that many things we identify as epistemic norms are also social norms, so that it's plausible that it's important to have that concept to do epistemology, especially social epistemology. I'll run through the motivating questions, those motivating questions, why I got interested in this topic. What the, that will do is we'll establish the moderate theses as at least worth, worth pursuing. And then I'll talk about norms and games. I'll talk about game theory. And so that's to set up uh, David's paper. If this were, if I were talking about quantified modal logic, most of you would know about it. Certainly if I did predicate calculus and scope ambiguities as a part of the talk, that would be familiar because it's part of our graduate training in philosophy. Game theory, however, is not a part of our training unless we want to specialize in a particular area. So I'll spend a little more time than I might otherwise to talk about game theory by just talking about two concrete games. Okay, part one, kinds of norms. Well, normativity is a hot topic. Uh, you ask a graduate student, what are you working on? And they'll say normativity, and then you'll say, well, what is that? And they'll say, well, it kind of has to do with normativity. Uh, it's a big topic, but it's hard to say what it is, right? So those are three very influential books in the field. It's mostly people working in ethics who've done a lot of the pioneering work on the nature of normativity. But also in epistemology, we've been doing it without explicitly theorizing normativity in general. So it's important not to talk past one another, and so it's important to specify the different senses of norms that you have in mind. So the first one is statistical. So if you've ever served on a college level or a university-wide level committee, your colleagues from different disciplines will use the term normative. And if they're psychologists, by normative they mean the statistical average. They don't mean ought. There are natural norms. This is a concept I've borrowed, and so I want to make it explicit. Then there's what I will call attitude-transcendent, objectively valid norms, attitude-dependent social norms, so that'll be our category. And I'll quickly contrast formal versus non-formal uh, attitude-dependent norms. All right, so statistically speaking, that's one sense of norm, the normal, the average. And again, there are many people who use the phrase normative just to mean that's, that's the average, whereas philosophers almost never use the phrase normative to mean that. They mean something else by normative. There's this concept of natural norms. So natural norms are associated with functions. And this is a passage, you can't see it, but it's a, a passage from Tyler Burge, who says, whenever there are functions, there are norms. So if the function of the heart is to pump blood, a norm is a standard or level of adequacy of performance of the heart in serving that function. In other words, given a function, how well are you doing? Right? And there are different dimensions, different ways of asking the question, how well you are doing. So whenever there are functions, there are natural norms. Uh, and here's a, another phrase. What, what you can't see in the text is that natural norms do not depend on anyone's pro-attitudes. So an animal its organs have functions, and so there are norms associated with the functions of the organs. But the animal doesn't have to have any idea about this whatsoever, doesn't have to embrace these standards or think it's a good idea or prescribe beating to its heart. So there are norms without any psychological attitudes. Right? Those are going to be natural norms. Uh, he argues for this in a paper and then later in his book, uh, Origins of Objectivity. And I think he's taking the phrase uh, from Philippa Foote, and it's a part of her project in ethics, to use the notion of natural norm to anchor epistemic normativity and epistemic, I'm sorry, moral normativity and moral virtue. Then there are attitude transcendent norms. So this is sort of what you learn uh, sometimes in philosophy, and maybe it's something you learn from Plato, that there, are, there are just are these norms, these standards. And maybe when it comes to ethics or morality, these standards of moral behavior, how we're supposed to act how we ought to act, and if we don't act that way, or if our culture doesn't act that way, if our culture doesn't embrace these norms, they're just wrong. So just as the laws of nature are attitude transcendent, it doesn't matter what we think, whether Newton's laws of gravity are true or not, so too the laws of morality or the laws of normativity 
are just out there independent of anyone's attitudes. They're attitude transcendent, and it's our job to get those right. right? So that's a strong realist view about the nature of normativity. And sometimes when people use the phrase in philosophy, normativity, or that's not really normative, they're expressing a commitment to this kind of view about the nature of normativity, that normativity is attitude transcendent. Right? That's one sense of norm, or one sense of normative. Then there's attitude-dependent senses of norms. So when the sociologist and the psychologist uses the phrase normative attitude or social norm, what they're talking about is our normative attitudes in the sense of the things we think we ought to do. So when we make judgments or we have preferences or oughtiness, like, oh, that's terrible, or that's, that was well done, or that's really what you ought to do, or don't do that, you shouldn't do that. When you're expressing those kinds of pro-attitudes, they will call those normative attitudes because in the content of the attitude is normative vocabulary or normative sentiments or normative feelings of obligation or audience, Right. So those are attitude-dependent norms, and that's our topic, what's going on in the minds of individuals within groups. So social norms is the big category that you find within social science of attitude-dependent norms and normativity. So here's the Wikipedia definition. All truth lies within Wikipedia. Uh, I think it's on, the, on your handout. So norms are cultural products. They're not transcendent. They're not outside of culture. Individuals have this knowledge. Individuals have these beliefs. Individuals have these attitudes. And they exist as representations within individual minds and, say, within the collective. That's where the norms are that we're talking about. Philip Pettit wrote an article that was really influential on my thinking on this topic called uh, Virtus Normativa. Uh, and here's his definition. He was building on the work of others. Uh, this is a definition that sees social norms as social practices, that is, it involves regularities in our behavior. And again, that's on the handout. So the definition is a regularity R in the behavior of members of the population P, that'll be a social norm, this regularity, where agents are in a recurrent type of situation S, where it's a social norm to the extent that, in any instance of S among members of P, they do it. They conform to the norm. That's the first part of the definition. They prescribe it. So there's, there's the normative attitude. You ought to do this. You ought not do that. And the fact that they prescribe it actually moves them to conform to the norm, to conform to the prescription. So it generates, or at least partly explains, the regularity. Right. That's his definition. And there are different kinds of motivations. Uh, one is that we aim to please. This is something Adam Smith made a big deal about. We care about what other people th think about us. So we're, if, if you have teenagers, you know what this is like when they're saying, you know, Mom, Mom Dad, I need money for these tennis shoes. I don't want to be out of place. This is what everyone else is doing. So they want to win other people's approval, and we don't like disapproval. This connects to attitudes of, of say, pride and shame. We want to avoid sanctions. So sometimes the sanctions are just disapproval, but sometimes it might be gossip, or it might be ostracism. We might get kicked out of the group if we're not conforming to other people's expectations about how we ought to behave. And we also internalize these social prescriptions. It becomes very important to us to behave the way we think we ought to behave. We may even positively value this form of behavior. So it ends up motivating our, ourselves intrinsically once we've internalized these prescriptions. So that's Pettit's definition, and I'll, I'll come back to that. There's a contrast once we're in the category of norms as attitude-dependent norms, where it has to do with the attitudes within the minds of a group, between formal and non-formal norms. So when we think about positive law, what the law says to do, those are norms, those are prescriptions. You ought to follow those sorts of things. They're not attitude transcendent. It's not as if the law is out there. Positive law is the law of a group or a community or a culture or society. So some of these attitude-dependent norms are laws. So those are formal ones. Now, when you've got formal ones, you've got both primary and secondary norms. The primary norms are like don't speed, pay your taxes, uh, don't just stab someone with a knife, and so on, the, the laws. But then the secondary norms 
Those are rules or norms for introducing primary ones. So how do you introduce a new law? Well, you send it through, say, the legislature, or you send it to the mayor, or you send it to the chancellor. You get these new norms, new laws put in place. So sometimes they often conflict as well, and you need to have rules or norms for resolving the conflicts, and that's what the courts are about. So when you've got law, you have both primary and secondary norms. They're often explicit. They're written down. Enforcement is delegated, so the police get to enforce the norms. There's a particular person or type of person who's responsible for enforcing uh, the norms. And then the sanctions are often tangible. That is, you might go to prison, or you might have to pay a fine, or you might be beaten with sticks, whatever the culture happens to, to do to punish people who violate the law. And they apply fundamentally to actions. There's not a lot of laws governing, say, beliefs or emotions. Rather, it's don't do this, don't do that. Non-formal norms are different. There are rarely secondary norms. And actually, one way of defining law is once you've got a system of both primary and secondary, then you've got a legal practice or you've got law. And so without it, you've got non-formal norms. They're often implicit. They're not written down. And it could take difficult work by a social psychologist or a sociologist to figure out what exactly they are. And the enforcement is widespread. So if right now I were to violate a social norm of giving talks at conferences, you would all cringe a little bit. And you might gossip about me afterwards. And you might disapprove. And you might not invite me to your next conference. You're all enforcing the social norm. So the enforcement is widespread. The sanctions are often intangible, like the ones I just gave. Right? It may be just a little disapproval, or it might be a little bit of gossip. It may or may not affect me in a big way. It's certainly not a fine or imprisonment. And they cover not just actions, but attitudes, what emotions you're supposed to have, how you're supposed to feel. Um, <clears throat> this is something we do when we raise our children. There are certain emotions and emotional responses we want them to have in certain kinds of situations. And we see they're not having it. We may even say, honey, you're supposed to want to help your brother. You're supposed to feel bad that this has happened. Right? And they're learning those uh, attitudes. And even, it even sometimes goes to deliberation. There are some things we're not even supposed to think about for example. All right, so that's the contrast between formal and non-formal. So a quick summary. Uh, there's the sense of norm as what usually happens. There's the sense of what should happen given a function. There are attitude transcendent objective norms. And then attitude dependent norms are psychological endorsements of how we, how we and others ought to behave, think, and do. So they, that's what they involve. And Pettit's definition is that they're regularities in behavior because prescribed. And there's a contrast between formal and informal. All right, that's part one. Part two, <clears throat> there's no heavy lifting here in part two. This is, this is all stuff that you already know because you're participants in a culture with plenty of social norms that you've internalized. So I'll just remind you of a handful that you've already got that you enforce. So don't litter, tip, wait in line at the subway, dress appropriately, don't stand too close, who you should marry, and what you should do with your cell phone. And lastly, recycle your trash. So let me be a little more concrete. In each case, you can ask, is there a regularity in behavior? Does it meet Pettit's definition? Let me say now, there are other definitions, and so it's contested. But it's a good way of testing both the definition and your mastery of the concept, whether there's a regularity in behavior. Is it widely prescribed? Is there an attitude that many of us have that we should behave like that? And does that attitude actually make a difference? Does it partly sustain or even cause the regularity in behavior? So when it comes to parks, you'll see signs like this. So it's being prescribed, at least by the people who run the park. And there are many clean parks. So you might think people do, in fact, follow the prescription. A lot of people actually go out and help uh, clean up the park. It's approved. We approve of it. And when we see people littering, you might think to yourself, jerk. You just have that instinctive reaction when someone is littering. And you may even be littering yourself and afterwards feel a little ashamed or feel a little bad that you've done it. Right? So that's one example. And we let people know what we think. Right? We even put up signs that say, not only follow it, but hey, pal, other people do it too. So that's one clear example. Uh, then there's tipping. Right? Tipping. It, feels, it can feel optional to some people. And you know those people. 
It feels obligatory, like I have to tip and I have to tip big. As soon as you're your husband or spouse, you know, maybe you're the low tipper and and uh, he's the the high tipper and he worked as a waiter at some time. Oh my gosh, do you learn to internalize this norm of big tips? Okay, uh, here's a guide if you're not entirely sure about how you should tip. Uh, I save a fortune by not getting my hair cut. Sort of <laughs> losing your hair has its advantages. Uh, the hotel housekeeper, who tips their housekeeper, right? Is that a, is that a norm, right? Um, you tip your chauffeur, but of course, but of course. <laughs> uh, we certainly uh, disapprove of when people don't tip, or there are groups that certainly disappro don't disapprove. So this was written up by Ted Vitale, so I'm not responsible for the language there on the bottom. <laughs> so tipping is definitely, definitely a social norm, but social norms are norms of cultures or groups, and they vary. So tipping in China, I took this simply off of a website, TravelAsia.com, and this is what it told, told me. It's uncommon, sometimes it's illegal. It's frowned upon, you're actually sometimes insulting your server by tipping. There are some exceptions. I was in Mexico City and I tipped the, dri the taxi driver, you don't do that. And I'm like, oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed now. So the bellman, I didn't tip him at all, only to find out you're supposed to tip the bellman. <laughs> okay? Do not tip in China and Taiwan. The same is true in Korea. Do not tip. This is so hard for an American when you get there on the first day. You just feel compelled to give them money. It's like saying you feel compelled to say you stink, right? Because the culture is so different. It's an insult. We're bringing our own psychological norms to this situation. Uh, switching to or continuing with the theme of China, this is Taiwan. This is Taipei. And this is the subway. Notice what's on the ground. They've painted lines for where you're supposed to stand so that people, when they exit, can exit without running into people. And you actually queue up. I love, I love Taiwan. It's just fantastic. They love to queue. You can actually stand, and you get a friend to stand behind you, and a friend to stand behind that friend. And then people will start queuing up, <laughs> having no idea that you're just standing there in front of them. <laughs> Uh, then there's dress codes. I am, I am dressed philosophy casual, right? I can wear jeans when I go to a philosophy conference. Um, when someone is really out of place, it feels very uncomfortable, both for the people there and for the person uh, dressed. So here's, here's an example of coming inappropriately dressed. Here's an even better example for those of you who watch Saturday Night Live. <laughs> right, so he's at a... <laughs> I've edited the picture. He's at a... <laughs> He's at a work meeting, and everyone's like, ugh. And he's like, it's the 4th of July, right? This is how you're supposed to dress. Certainly not at work. Uh, then there's personal space. So I know David well enough where I can walk right up to him and not make him feel too uncomfortable. But if he were a stranger, and I said, it was a really pleasure to meet you, <laughs> he'd feel very uncomfortable. So there are norms for distances. and different cultures, it varies uh, how far you should stand apart. So this is Western culture. That's where it's too close, a close talker. So we might remember that episode. Uh, then there's norms for marriage, right? Who, who should you or should you not marry? And this varies by culture. So it's, it's changing in our culture. So here's opposition. This is opposition to gay marriage. Um, and for a long time, of course, it was frowned upon, disapproved of. It was illegal. Uh, but that's changing. And so gay marriage is now legal in, I think, half of our states. Uh, and here's an interesting study about the difference between the law and social norms. So in 1967, full access to interracial marriage. Uh, but I just saw a report the other day in some country, some states in the United States, over half of the population is still against interracial marriage. They disapprove. So it happens, but how prevalently does it happen? And notice how gay marriage, the legality, has come after changes in attitudes. Right? Uh, so there's one. And then if you just read any sociology textbook, there'll be a chapter on social norms, social attitudes, and marriage comes up. And it, it varies widely around, around the world who you're supposed to marry. Someone within your class, outside of your class, same age, different age, and so on. So you know people who sometimes get married and their ages are really far apart. And your instinctive reaction is disapproval.
well, then you might be tolerant and think, well, you know, maybe it works for them, right? Whereas in other cultures, that's just how it goes. If people marry to the same age, you're like, well, is that really going to work? Right? So again, it's patterns of approval, disapproval that vary across cultures. Uh, so this is just a slide, again, from some sociologist's lecture on, on this topic about how they're not natural but arbitrary, cultural defined. They, do, they have to do with our attitudes about how we should live together. This is my favorite example. Uh, that's the president on the phone. Well, when cell phones came out, people talked really loud on them. Right? And they might do this in line, and you hear them talking the whole time, or in a cafe, or in the library. All right, so I almost got so angry that I was about to beat up an undergraduate who was talking on the phone in the stacks. Okay? Sandy tells me that's not him, but <laughs> there's a striking resemblance. Uh, what people are doing when they're talking on the phone is they're modulating their, their own volume to the volume that's coming in. So if you were to turn the volume way down and kind of you could talk quietly, right? But if you've got it turned way up, right, you just sort of freeze your, your sense of what's around you and you try to so you end up talking really loud when you're talking on a cell phone unless you become aware of what you're doing. And so that's changing. More and more people are annoyed. And you can now buy these business cards that you can hand to somebody. They even have fill in the blank business cards that you can <laughs> hand to somebody. <laughs> there are some people who even get arrested if enough people complain. Uh, the, the cops will come and take them off a train, for example, if they won't respond. And you'll see these. I put these on my, my uh, syllabus when I'm teaching large lectures so that everyone remembers to turn off their phone. And now people are very comfortable with it. You'll go to movies and they'll say, turn off your phone, and, and people will do it. So this, I don't like it, we don't like it, leads to a change in people's behavior. And now it's a norm to turn off your phone, to keep it on silent, to not talk on the phone, and to not talk loud. And this is now customary. Uh, if you go to Seattle and you open up anyone's, you know, underneath their, their sink, you'll see all the different recycling bins. Right? So this has become a common practice in many parts of the country. So social norms are ubiquitous. Here are quite a few of them. Some involve what are or what we'll call public goods dilemmas. Littering, talking on the phone, recycling, you sort of pay a cost. Some don't obviously solve a public good dilemma. Uh, I'll leave that to David to explain. Uh, but changes in attitudes change norms. They change what we do. Right? So there's the norm in the sense of the psychological attitude. There's the norm in the sense of the regularity of behavior. And then there's two put together as the social norm in Pettit's definition. And one, our prescriptions, can change or sustain the other. So that's the idea of social norms. And that's why it's in a very important category for social science because social science is about explaining the behavior of groups and individuals within groups. OK, now to epistemic norms. Could epistemic norms be social norms? Well, epistemic norms, we all agree, govern belief formation, belief revision, belief maintenance, belief transmission, one belief to another person or to a group, belief reception, what you should do when it's offered to you, and inquiry, how you should go about getting evidence on various topics. So I argued in a paper uh, that's coming out in, in David and John's volume that there are norms for truth-telling that are social norms, that we prescribe them, and it makes a difference to what we do. So when someone needs information, whether P, provide it. Now, this may involve going out and finding it if you don't have it already. So it's a kind of a strong norm. A weaker norm is that if you've got it already, provide it. And this isn't the same of simply giving it when you're asked. When someone's walking around lost, maybe the norm is walk up to them and say, are you lost? That could vary. You could have that kind of norm. And here's the weakest one, which is don't mislead or lie. We disapprove of people who mislead or lie. So I've argued for that. Uh, but in general, how would you find out whether epistemic norms are social norms? Well, you just take the definition, and then you go and see. You do a little investigation. So I think it's certainly true that there are people who express these attitudes. So believe on the evidence is something many people prescribe. 
And part of Clifford's project in that very famous paper was to encourage people to follow the norm, believe on the evidence. And he gave examples where people didn't, and he expressed extreme disapproval. Now, maybe it was a moral failing, so it's a moral expression of a judgment, but it's certainly an added to dependent expression of a judgment. And in critical thinking classes, we're trying to help our students improve their ability to do this. And sometimes it's really, we're really norming them into these standards, as opposed to, well, you know, here's what critical thinking is, and you're going to take an exam. I don't really care if you do this. I just want you to have this knowledge about what it is, right? It's not really a purely academic pursuit. We're really trying to change their minds, and change it not by just giving them the skills, but by getting them to internalize the prescriptions that this is how they really ought to reason. And of course, the scientific method is what we teach them in many of our courses across the university. And that might be something, too, that we disapprove of when people don't use it. You ever get a study, you know, you're reading this, you're like, they didn't use random trials, right? And you start norming one another to behave in a particular way in your scientific communities. Drug tests, these used to be open trials and then single blind, and now we're up to triple blind. And again, there might be, you might lose your funding if you don't do it in a particular way, or you won't get published, or you won't get promoted. Or people will say, that guy's not a very good researcher. He only uses single-blind trials when he does drug tests. It gets enforced by law as well in certain types of cases, but not always. And you can look to the history of science to see whether or not there have been epistemic norms that are social norms. And part of the evidence is when you get variation over cultures, when you've got the norms all right, but they change. So uh, Stephen Chapin wrote a great book, Social History of Truth. This is about the Royal Society and the Scientific Revolution. He said that there are all these norms that have to do with things like, are you a gentleman? What's your status to be a member of the group to do science? So even to join the community, there were norms about who belonged and who did not. They changed. There's ancient norms of cutting open chickens and going to the oracle. Uh, medieval norms of asking what, what Aristotle said. Uh, <laughs> I guess those norms haven't changed. Uh, <laughs> There's a scientific revolution, of course, brought out plenty of different kinds of, of norms. And then you get diversity in the natural sciences and the social sciences. So there are different kinds of methodologies and different forms of inquiry. And that's what's sort of both exciting and frustrating as you try to talk across disciplines. Uh, for, again, at, at a university, when they have interdisciplinary studies across the humanities and social sciences, it's striking that they have the same methodology. So, you know, Foucault and so on, post-structuralism is the methodology, but there are different departments. So it can seem interdisciplinary, but it's not interdisciplinary when it comes to methodology. Right? There's a continuity in methodology. And of course, in the humanities, what counts as methodology are the norms of good belief formation, inquiry, argument, and so on in philosophy. Right? So we can think of communities in part as their methodologies. So just as we think of cultures as their social norms, so China is different from the United States because of tipping, so too one discipline is different from another discipline because of their methodology. So you can turn to the sociology of science to look for norms. Uh, Robert Merton was a famous uh, sociologist who got this up and running, the sociology of science. And he just said the norms are, and the definition we see up here is social norms. They look like social norms. They're implicit. They figure them out. It's a part of being a member of a group. So he thought he could discover the norms of science. So one is universalism, which means you don't have to be at MIT or Princeton to be a member of the club. You could be at any university. In fact, you don't even have to be at a university. You could be rich or poor. Membership is universal. He called this, this is in the 50s, he said communism, probably a poor choice of words. He meant once you made a discovery, it's common property. You don't own it anymore. You don't charge people for it. Right? It's common property, and you're supposed to be disinterested. You're out to discover the truth, not for fame. Going for fame is frowned upon. And the scientific method. So what we clearly see as epistemic norms, that's a part of science, but there are also norms about how science is to be conducted, who belongs, who doesn't, and so on. And there are anti-evidential norms in various communities. So this is, this, this is, I saw this at the airport. This is the latest issue of National Geographic, the war on science. So to be a member of some communities is to be opposed to vaccinations, or to be opposed to evolution, or to disbelieve climate science, and so on. 
All right, so quickly, a summary. There's at least a prima facie case for thinking that when, when we're thinking about epistemology and epistemic norms, a lot of those are social norms. All right, motivated questions. This will be familiar to it. I'll go through this section fast. So why should we care as epistemologists? Why not just leave it to epistemologists? Well, I got interested because I'm interested in this question. Right? Many of us here are interested in this question. Why do people tell the truth? Why not keep it to themselves? Why are speakers as reliable as they are when we're sharing information? What's our motive? So I started thinking about cooperation. What explains cooperation in general? And there's been an explosion of research about explanations of human cooperation. It used to be a puzzle. We were only after our own individual self-interest. Why do we help each other out? And social norms has become one of the prominent answers. It's because we norm each other for cooperative behavior. And even Paul Faulkner, uh, he beat me to this thesis. Uh, this is an article called Norms of Trust, and of course you can't see any of that. But his answer to the question, why do we have reason to trust other people, is because there are norms for truthfulness, social norms for truthfulness. Uh, this is a talk I've given a couple times where I've argued that the reliability of testimony is partly explained by social norms, and it's that that got David and I cooperating on this, on this topic. So it's relevant to one of the questions we care about. So that supports the moderate thesis. Also, what is the point and purpose of epistemic evaluations? We're now interested not simply in, in these eternal norms, but when we're norming each other, why are we doing it? Um, so this got fired up, interest in this, by uh, Edward Craig's interesting book, which Lizzie has <laughs> destroyed in her excellent recent article on the topic. Uh, but it's got a lot of interest. And here's the table of contents for uh, David and John's uh, book of essays uh, on, this, on this topic. And uh, Sinan Doramudja uh, is defending a thesis that he calls epistemic communism, where he thinks our epistemic evaluations get us to conform to the same norms. So we coordinate on the same standards. So I can always take whatever you would say at face value, because you're using the same standards I'm using. So you're another of me. Right? Uh, Doramudja has argued for that. We might even ask uh, about norms when it comes to speech acts. So what norms govern speech acts? Uh, Searle famously argued uh, that speech acts are rule-governed, rule-constituted. Uh, this is something William Alston has also said, that in making a speech act, you're taking on certain kinds of responsibilities to engage in certain forms of behavior. That could be a social norm. Uh, Sellers and, and Wittgenstein famously argued for this as well, and another paper where Branham argues against Grice, a Grice view of speech acts, he says it all has to do with norms. So maybe the norms are social norms, and this is something uh, Timothy Williamson did not argue for. He argued that they were constitutive norms like rules of the game, and today Lizzie will enlighten us on this topic. They're both, okay. <laughs> Great. And we're all anxiously awaiting our free copy of this book in our mailboxes. <laughs> Another deeper question, and this is the question ethicists are interested in, is the metaphysical basis of normativity. So Wittgenstein has been very influential and in sellers in thinking that it really is just behavioral norms, cultural norms, and maybe that's all there is to epistemic normativity. You find this defended in Rorty. He calls his view epistemological behaviorism, and then a more sophisticated way in work from uh, Michael Williams. So maybe all there is to epistemic normativity is social normativity. And a nice little review by Matthew Christman, and this is bringing together the literature of, from expressivism and ethics to the literature on epistemic normativity in epistemology. Lastly, there's epistemology's engineering. There are many people who will say epistemology is normative. <laughs> I never knew what that meant, other than, well, you know, we're trying to discover what justification is. And that's normative, isn't it? What they mean with people who insist on this is the job of the epistemologist is to change the world. It's revisionary, it's engineering. Right? So uh, Bishop and Trout, they think analytic epistemology is sterile, it's a waste of time. What we really need to do is figure out what works and then get people to use the things that work. We need to change the norms. That was their project. Uh, Miranda Fricker has been interested in this, that there are many social norms about who to believe and who not to believe. And she thinks this means people get discounted. There's a, a kind of injustice that people are not given their due respect. Uh, 
when it comes to receiving their testimony. And C. Fuller, insofar as I understand what C. Fuller's up to, it's really about models for changing what we do. Right? So philosophy, its job, or epistemology, its job is to come up with proposals to change the way we do science, the way we do inquiry, the way we organize our lives. Okay. So I think these are all good reasons to be interested in social norms, and we already are, even if we don't have the concept explicitly theorized throughout social epistemology. All right, so I think that's enough for the weak thesis. Now it comes for the good stuff, and I've got six minutes to stay within 45. Okay, This is the fun part. So weak thesis, you should have the concept. It's a useful concept. Moderate theses, moderate theses, Maybe a lot of norms, maybe a lot of epistemic norms are also social norms. And so the question you might be interested in when you do social epistemology could be illuminated, better understood, argued for in a clearer way by making use of the concept of, of social norms. Um, <clears throat> okay, norms and games. This is a bit of a, a shift. So game theory, it's all the rage. Uh, it kind of unifies various parts of the social sciences. So you've got economists who know it, you've got political scientists who know it, you've got sociologists who know it, you've got anthropologists who know it, and of course you've got mathematicians who love exploring it. Okay? So it's become a, a rich tool within the social sciences, and my understanding of it is, is entirely elementary, uh, but I see that it's very important that if you're going to do social epistemology and philosophy that's related to social science, it's a concept you really need to possess. So the way to introduce it is with the prisoner's dilemma. Now for some people this is a piece of cake. You've taught the prisoner's dilemma hundreds of times yourself. I always get stuck. My brain freezes up looking at these. Here's the way to think of it. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma is that two people have been arrested. They're buddies, maybe they're confederates. They're separated out and the, pros the district attorney or whoever says, look, if you confess I'll give you a shorter sentence and your buddy's in big trouble. But if your buddy also confesses, your buddy gets a shorter sentence, maybe five years. But if both of you keep silent, it's just one year. And if you confess, you'll go free. Is that right? If you, no, no. If you confess, you, if, if, we'll just walk through it. See what I mean? See what I mean? OK, so a, a, prisoner A has two choices. He can confess or he can remain silent. Those are his two choices. And here's how he reasons. He so says, suppose my buddy confesses. Well, if my buddy confesses and I confess, I get five years. If I remain silent and my buddy confesses, I get 20 years. Five years is better than 20. So on the assumption that my buddy confesses, I should confess. Then he says, OK, suppose my buddy remains silent. Well, if I confess, I get, I get to go free. This is a great deal. But if I remain silent, and my buddy remains silent, it's a year. Well, zero is better than one when it comes to going to prison, so I should confess. So if my buddy confesses, I should confess. If my buddy remains silent, I should confess. So no matter what my buddy does, I should confess. Well, your buddy's reasoning in exactly the same way. So you both will end up confessing. And when you both end up confessing, you both get five years which is worse than if both of you had remained silent. That's the dilemma. You'd be better off if you both remained silent, but the logic of self-interest in the situation leads both of you to confess. Right? That's the prisoner's dilemma. And it's just saying, we've got rational self-interest with all this information. What will happen? The worst a, a worse outcome. So here's the reasoning, once again. Here's, here's another one, the public goods game. Right? So this is a great, a great slide. You've got the people cooperating. These are the people cleaning up the trash, vacuuming the floors, building the house. But it's a public good, which means everyone gets access to it. Right? So if other people clean the park, I can walk into the park whether I clean it up or not. So you've got the people on the right who are kind of free riding. They're taking advantage of the public good without putting in the labor necessary for the public good to exist. Right? This is a great concept to have because we're facing these challenges all the time 
in our life. So a friend of mine is in a guild in World of Warcraft. So I've learned about World of Warcraft in order, in order to understand my students. It's the most popular video game online in the world. And you play in groups. And there's a leader who takes responsibility for doing the work to organize things. Now, if you're thinking, wow, I really want to be in a guild that's well organized, that runs on time, that gets things done. I, I just love that. But I don't have time to, to put in any work. So I want to be in a guild where I don't have to do anything. Well, what happens to the guy running the guild? Burnout, anger, frustration. I see a couple of people nodding heads like, yeah, when I was in my guild, this happened all the time. <laughs> all right? Anger and frustration that people are not helping out. So every department chair knows what this is like. When you're running a tight ship, and in order for things to happen, people need to contribute, and it's mostly voluntary, and there are some people who never show up but they benefit from the well-organized department. They're free riders, right? Well, once you start to see that other people are free riding on you, what's your reaction, Sandy? You quit. Actually, you don't. You keep signing up for more. <laughs> you quit, and then what happens? It falls apart. So the average length of time of a guild in World of Warcraft is three months. They come together, they play for a while, people get angry and upset, and they fall apart. So you can do this in terms of littering, right? So if I, if I show up and other people are picking up, the park is clean, what do I want to do? Do I want to pick up or do I want to enjoy the park and just leave my trash? Well, picking up tr my trash takes effort. I don't want to pay that cost, so I'm going to litter. Rational self-interest. I get the clean park, but I don't have to pick up my trash. That's fantastic. I can be in the group. I can be in the department without doing any work. But if everyone else reasons that way as well, the park is a mess, the guild falls apart, and the department is dysfunctional, and then you get an external chair. <laughs> okay, so how do we solve these problems? Well, there's work on social norms, that social norms can solve problems. So Christina Bicareri, is she still in England? She's at Penn? She's Penn, okay. She's at Penn. Uh, she's written this fantastic book from 1986, I think. Is that really? Fantastic book uh, on the nature of social norms. And she gives a definition that's different from Pettit. So this is to illustrate the point that there's more than one definition out there. And this is what uh, David's going to build on in his, his uh, talk. So here's the definition. It's on the handout. Let R be a behavior rule for situations of type S, where S can be re represented as a mixed motive game. So the mixed motive games are games like public goods games or prisoner's dilemmas, games, where you pay a cost for a benefit. R is a social norm in a population. If there's a sufficiently large subset of the population where the individuals that make up that population know that the rule exists and applies to the situation. They know about the rule, and they have a conditional preference, and this is what's uh, key to Bicarari's account. The individual who knows about the rule in that situation prefers to conform, conform to the rule on the condition that the individual expects other people to conform as well. So I want to do it if I think other people are doing it. And either <coughs> I believe a sufficiently large number of people expect me to do it, or they expect me to do it, and they'll sanction me if I don't. That's the abstract definition. Concretely, it's pretty straightforward. So think of the rule, please don't litter. So suppose I know don't litter applies, and I know most people conform, and they expect me to do it. Given that, my preferences change. I now want to be a non-litterer when I go to the park. My preferences have changed. That's something I want. Same for the prisoner's dilemma. If the rule is don't rat out your confederate, don't rat out your buddies, then again, your preferences change. You don't want to rat them out. <clears throat> so norms then are game changers because the preferences change. The math changes. This is how it was before. Before the norm, it was 2-3, right? So I'd rather litter than pick up. But once you change the game, 
and you've got the rule, I'd rather pick up when other people are picking up than litter. So people, once they're aware of the rule, they follow it, their preferences change, you solve the problem. People are no longer motivated by self-interest to simply throw stuff on the ground, but they will pick it up. So here's the question. If appeals to norms can explain, can explain how we solve mixed motive games, then maybe appeals to epistemic norms can help explain how we solve mixed motive situations when it comes to sharing information, when building a scientific community, and maybe even when revising our scientific communities. So the question is, the difficult question is, what's the game? What's the game from game theory that's going to help us model the issue when it comes to sharing information, acquiring information, picking up information from one another? What is the truth game exactly? And the difficulty is, and so this is the advertisement for David's talk, the difficulty is it's hard to know what the right game is, just taking a game off the shelf. We really don't know what the game is when we're sharing information with one another so what is the truth game? Summary, there are many different kinds of norms. Please keep the differences in mind. And one prescription that we have may be more than one kind of norm. That's always possible. Social norms are everywhere. They're ubiquitous in our lives. Many epistemic prescriptions are social norms. That matters to epistemology. We should know about the concept. And game theory, we hope, will deepen our understanding of our sharing of information, our inquiry into information and our epistemic lives in general. Now, I didn't have a picture of me and David together, so I relied on somebody else uh, to get the picture at the very end. Thank you very much. <laughs>